The Golden Compass, Chapter 20, Mortal Combat. Fights between bears were common, and the subject of much ritual. For a bear to kill another was rare, though, and when that happened, it was usually by accident, or when one bear mistook the signals from another, as in the case of Yurik Bernison. Cases of the straightforward murder, like Yurifer's killing of his own father, were rarer still. But occasionally, there, were some, there came circumstances in which the only way of settling a dispute an argument was a fight to the death, and for that, a whole ceremonial was prescribed. As soon as Yurifer announced that Yurik Bernison was on his way and a combat would take place, the combat ground was swept and smoothed, and armorers came up from the fire mines to check Yurifer's armor. Every rivet was examined, every link tested, and the plates were burnished with the finest sand. Just as much attention was paid to his claws, the gold leaf was rubbed off and each separate six-inch hook was sharpened and filed to a deadly point. Lyra watched with a growing sickness in the pit of her stomach, for Yurik Bernison wouldn't be having this attention. He had been marching over the ice for nearly 24 hours already without rest or food. He might have been injured in the crash, and she had let him in for this fight without his knowledge. At one point after Yurfer Rackneson had tested the sharpness of his claws on a fresh-killed walrus, slicing its skin open like paper and the power of his crashing blows on the walrus's skull, two blows, and it was like and it was cracked like an egg, Lyra had to make an excuse to Yurfer and go away by herself to weep, to cry with fear. Even Pantalaemon, who could normally cheer her up, had little to say that was hopeful. All she could do was consult the owl thermometer. He is an hour away, it told her, and again, she must trust him. And, this was harder to read, she even thought it was rebuking her for asking the same question twice. By this time, word had spread among the bears, and every part of the combat ground was crowded. Bears of high rank had the best places, and there was a special enclosure for the she-bears, including, of course, Yurfer's wives. Lyra was profoundly curious about she-bears because she knew so little about them. But this was no time to wander about asking questions. Instead, she stayed close to Yurfer Rackinson and watched the courtiers, courtier, courtiers are around him assert their rank over the common bears from outside and tried to guess the meaning of the various plumes and badges and tokens they all seemed to wear. Some of the highest rankings she saw carry little mannequins like your first ragdoll demon, trying to curry favor, perhaps, by imitating the fashion he'd begun. She was sardonically pleased to notice that when they saw that Yurfer had discarded his, they didn't know what to do with theirs. Should they throw them away? Were they out of favor now? How should they behave? Because that was the prevailing mood in the court. In his court, she was beginning to see. There what they weren't they weren't sure what they were. They weren't like Yurik Bernison, pure and certain and absolute. There was a constant pall of uncertainty hanging over them as they watched one another and watched Yurfer. And they watched her with open curiosity. She remained modestly close to Yurifer and said nothing, lowering her eyes whenever a bear looked at her. The fog had lifted by this time, and the air was clear, and by chance would have it, and as chance would have it, the brief lifting of darkness towards noon coincided with the time Lyra thought Yurik was going to arrive. As she stood shivering on a little rise of dense packed snow at the edge of the combat ground, she looked up towards the faint lightness in the sky and longed with all her heart to see a flight of ragged, elegant black shapes descending to bear her away, or to see the Aurora's hidden city where she would be able to walk safely long along those broad boulevards of, in the sunlight or to see Makasa's broad arms, to smell the friendly smells of flesh and cooking that enfolded you in her presence. She found herself crying with tears that froze almost as soon as they formed, 
in which she had to brush away painfully. She was so frightened. Bears who didn't cry couldn't understand what was happening to her. It was some human process, meaningless. And of course, Pantalaemon couldn't comfort her as he normally would, though she kept her hand in her pocket firmly around his warm little mouse form, and he nuzzled at her fingers. Again, Pantalaemon can't help her because she's pretending to be a demon, so Pantalaemon has to stay hidden. Beside her, the smiths were making the final adjustments to Eurofor Ragnarsson's armor. He reared like a great metal tower, shining in polished steel, the smooth plates inlaid with wires of gold. His helmet enclosed the upper part of his head in a glistening carapace oops, of silver gray with deep eye slits, and the underside of his body was protected by a close-fitting sark of chain mail. It was when she saw that this saw this that Lyra realized that she had betrayed Yurik Bernison, for Yurik had nothing like it. His armor protected only his back and sides. She looked at Yurik Arachnison, so sleek and powerful, and felt a deep sickness in her, like guilt and fear combined. She said, Excuse me, your majesty, if you remember what I said to you before. Her shaking voice felt thin and weak in the air. Yurik Arachnison turned his mighty head, distracted from the target. Three bears were holding up in front of him to slash at with his perfect claws. Yes, yes. Remember, I said I'd better go and speak to Yurik Bernison first and pretend. But before she could even finish her sentence, there was a roar from the bears on the watchtower. The others all knew what it meant and took it up with a trump triumphant excitement. They had seen Yurik. Please, Lyra said urgently. I'll fool him, you'll see. Yes, yes, go now. Go and encourage him. Yurfa Ragnason was hardly able to speak for rage and excitement. Lyra left his side and walked across the combat ground, bare and clear as it was, leaving her little footprints in the snow, and the bears on the far side parted to let her through. As their great bodies lumbered aside, the horizon opened, gloomy in the parlor of the light, in the power of the light. Where was Jurek Bernison? She could see nothing, but then the watchtower was high and they could see what was still hidden from her. All she could do was walk forward in the snow. He saw her before she saw him. There was a bounding and a heavy clank of metal, and in a flurry of snow, Jurek Bernison stood beside her. Oh, Jurek, I've done a terrible thing. My dear, you're going to have to fight your Ragnason, and you ain't ready. You're tired and hungry, and your armor's... What terrible thing. I told you, I told him you was coming because I read it on the symbol reader. And he's desperate to be like a person and have a demon, just desperate. So I tricked him into thinking that I was your demon. And I was going to desert you and be his instead. But he had to fight you to make it happen. Because otherwise, you're a dear, they never let you fight. They were going to just burn you up before you got close. You tricked your Ferracnison? Yes, I made him agree that he'd fight you instead of just killing you straight off like an outcast, and the winner would be king of the bears. I had to do that because... Balakwa? No, you are Lyra Silvertongue, he said. To fight him is all I want. Come, little demon. She looked at Yurik Bernison in his battered armor, lean and ferocious, and felt as if her heart would burst with pride. They walked together towards the massive hulk of Yurfur's palace, where the combat ground lay flat and open at the foot of the walls. Bears clustered at the battlements. White faces filled every window, and their heavy forms stood like a dense wall of misty white ahead, marked with the black dots of eyes and noses. The nearest one moved aside, making two lines for Yurik Bernison and his demon to walk between. Every bear's eyes were fixed on them. Yurik halted across the combat ground from Yurfa Arachnason. The king came down from the rise of trodden snow, and the two bears faced each other several yards apart. Here we go. Lyra was so close to Yurik that she could feel a trembling in him, like a giant dynamo, generating mighty ambaric forces. She touched him briefly on the neck at the edge of his helmet and said, Fight well, Yurik, my dear. You're the real king, and he ain't. He's nothing. Then she stood back. 
bears, Yurik Burnus and roared. An echo rang back from the palace walls and startled the birds out of their nest. He went on. The terms of this combat are these. If Yurifor Rakdus and kills me, then he will be king forever, safe from challenge or dispute. If I kill Yurifor Rakdus, then I shall be your king. My first order to you all will be to tear down that palace, that perfumed house of mockery and tinsel, and hurl the gold and marble into the sea. Iron is bare metal, gold is not. Yurifor Rakdus has polluted Slobbard. I have come to cleanse it. Yurifor Rakdus, I challenge you. Then Yurifer bounded forward a step or two as if he could hardly hold himself back. Bears, he roared in his turn. Yurik Burnison has come back at my invitation. I drew him here. It is for me to make the terms of this combat, and they are these. If I kill Yurik Burnison, his flesh shall be torn apart and scattered to the cliff gas. His head shall be displayed above my palace. His memory shall be obliterated. It shall be capital crime to speak his name. He continued, and then each bear spoke again. It was a formula, a ritual faithfully followed. Lyra looked at the two of them, so utterly different. Yurfer, so glossy and powerful, immense in his strength and health, splendidly armored, proud and king-like. And Yurik, smaller, though she had never thought he would look, he would look so small and poorly equipped, his armor rusty and dented, but his armor was his soul. He had made it, and it fitted him. They were one. Yurfer was not content with his armor. He wanted another soul as well. He was restless while Yurik was still. And she was aware that all the bears were making the comparison too, but Yurik and Yurfer were more than just two bears. There were two kinds of boredom, beardom opposed here. Two futures, two destinies. Yurifer had begun to take them in one direction, and Yurik would take them in another. And in the same moment, one future would close forever as the other began to unfold. As the ritual combat moved towards a second phase, the two bears began to prowl restlessly in the snow, edging forward, swinging their heads. There was not a flicker of movement from the spectators, but all eyes followed them. Finally, the warriors were still and silent watching each other face to face across the width of the combat grounds. Then, with a roar and a blur of snow, both bears moved at the same moment, like two great masses of rocks balanced on adjoining peaks and shaken loose by an earthquake, which bounded down which bound down the mountain sides, gathering speed, leaping over crevices and knocking trees into splinters until they crash into each other so hard that both are smashed to powder and flying chips of stone. That was how the two bears came together. The crash as they met resounded in the still air and echoed back from the palace wall. But they weren't destroyed as rock would have, would have been. They both fell aside, and the first to rise was Jurek. He twisted up in a, lip, in a life spring and grappled with Yurfer, whose armor had been damaged by the collision, and who couldn't easily ra raise his head Yurik made at once for the vulnerable gap at his neck. He raked the white fur and then hooked his claws beneath the edge of Yurifer's helmet and wrenched it forward. Sensing the danger, Yurifer snarled and shook himself as Lyra had seen Yurik shake himself at the water's edge, sending sheets of water flying high into the air. And Yurik fell away, dislodged. And with a screech of twisting metal, Yurifer stood up tall, straightening the steel of his, of his back plates by sheer strength. Then, like an avalanche, he hurled himself down on Yurik, who was still trying to rise. Lyra felt her own breath knocked out of her by the force of that crashing fall. Certainly, the very ground shook beneath her. How could Yurik survive that? He was struggling to twist himself and gain a purchase on the grounds, but his feet were uppermost, and Yurifer had fixed his teeth somewhere near Yurik's throat. Drops of hot blood were flying through the air. One landed on Ly Lyra's furs, and she pressed her hand to it like a token of love.
Sorry about that. Then Yurik's rear claw dug into the links of your first chain mail sark and ripped downward. The whole front came away, and Yurifer lurched sideways to look at the damage, leaving Yurik to scramble upright again. For a moment, the two bears stood apart, getting their breath back. Yurifer was hampered now by that chain mail, because from a protection, it had changed all at once into a hindrance. It was still fastened at the bottom and trailed around his rear legs. However, Yurik was worse off. He was bleeding freely from a wound at his, at his neck and panting heavily. heavily. But he leaped at Yurfer because the king could disentangle himself from the clinging chain mail and knocked his head over heels. Before the king could disentangle himself from the clinging chain mail, he knocked him head over heels, following up with a lunge at the bare part of Yurfer's neck where the edge of the helmet was bent. Yurfer threw him off, and then the two bears were at each other again, throwing up fountains of snow that sprayed in all directions and sometimes made it hard to see who had the advantage. Lyra watched, hardly daring to breathe, and squeezing her hands together so tight it hurt. She thought she saw Yurfer tearing at a wound in Yurfer's belly, but that couldn't be right. Because a moment later, after another convulsive explosion of snow, both bears were standing upright like boxers, and Yurik was slashing with mighty claws at Yurfer's face, with Yurfer hitting back just as savagely. Oops. Lyra trembled at the weight of these blows, as if a giant were swinging a sledgehammer, and that hammer were armed with five steel spikes. Iron clanged on iron. Teeth crashed on teeth. Breath roared harshly. Feet thundered on the hard-packed ground. The snow around was splashed with red and trodden down for yards into a crimson mud. Yurfer's armor was in a pitiful state by this time. The plates torn and distorted. The gold inlay torn out of smeared thickly with blood. And his helmet gone altogether. Yurix was in much better condition for all its ugliness, dented but intact, standing up far better to the great sledgehammer blows of the Bear King and turning aside those brutal six-inch claws. But against that, Yurfer was bigger and stronger than Yurik, and Yurik was weary and hungry and had lost more, more blood. He was wounded in the belly, on both arms, and at the neck, whereas Yurfer was bleeding only from the lower jaw. Lyra longed to help her dear friend, but what could she do? And it was going badly for Yurik now. He was limping. Every time he put his left forepaw on the ground, they could see that it hardly bore his weight. He never used it to strike with, and the blows from his right hand were feebler. Two, almost little pats compared with the mighty crushing buffets he delivered only a few minutes before. Yurfer had noticed. He began to taunt Yurik, calling him broken hands, whimpering cub, rusty and soon to die, and other names, all the while swinging blows at him from right and left, which Yurik could no longer parry. Yurik had to move backward, a step at a time, and the crouch low under the rain of blows from the jeering bear king. Lyra was in tears. Her dear, her brave one, her fearless defender was going to die, and she would not do him the treachery of looking away. For if he looked at her, he must see her shining eyes and their love and belief. Not a face hidden in cowardice or a shoulder fearfully turned away. So she looked, but her tears kept her from seeing what she was really happening. And perhaps it would not have been visible to her anyway. It certainly was not seen by Yurfer. Because Yurik was moving backward only to find clean, dry footing and a firm rock to leap up from, and the useless left arm was really fresh and strong. You could not trick a bear, but as Lyra had shown him, Yurfer did not want to be a bear. He wanted to be a man, and Yurik was tricking him. Oh, snap. And at last, he found what he wanted, a firm rock deep anchored in the permafrost. He backed against it, tensed his legs, and choosing his moment. It came when Yurfer reared high above, bellowing his triumph and turning his head tauntingly towards Yurik's apparently weak left side. 
That was when Yurik moved like a wave that had been building its strength over a thousand miles of ocean and which makes little stir in the deep water, but which when it reaches the shallows, rears itself up high into the sky, terrifying the shore dwellers before crashing down on the land with irresistible power. So Yurik Burnison rose up against Yurifer, exploding upward from his fur footing on the dry rock and slashing with a ferocious left hand at the exposed jaw of Yurifer Ragnason. It was a horrifying blow. It tore the lower part of his jaw clean off so that it flew through the air, scattering blood drops in the snow many yards away. Yurfer's red tongue lolled down, dripping op- over his open throat. The Bear King was suddenly voiceless, biteless, helpless. Yurik needed nothing more. He lunged, and then his teeth were in Yurfer's throat, and he shook and shook this way, that way, lifting the huge body off the ground and battering it down as if Yurfer were no more than a seal at the water's edge. Then he ripped upward, and Yurfer Ragnason's life came away in his teeth. There was one ritual yet to perform. Yurik sliced open the dead king's unprotected chest, oh my god, peeling the fur back to expose the narrow white and red ribs like the timbers of an upturned boat. Into the ribcage Yurik reached, and he plucked out Yurfer's heart, red and steaming, and ate it there in front of Yurfer's subjects. Then there was acclamation, pandemonium, and a crush of bears surging forward to pay homage to Yurfer's conqueror. Yurik Bernison's voice rose with the clamor. Bears, who is your king? And the cry came back in a roar like all, like of all the sea-smooth pebbles in the world in an ocean-battering storm. Yurik Bernison! The bears knew what they must do. Every single badge and, sa- and sash and coronet was thrown off at once and trampled contemptuously underfoot to be forgotten in a moment. They were Yurik bears now, and true bears, not uncertain, semi-humans, conscious only of, t- of a torturing inferiority. They swarmed to the palace and began to hurl great blocks of marble from the topmost towers, rocking the battlement, the battlemented walls with their mighty fists until the stones came loose, and then hurling them over the cliffs to crash on the jetty hundreds of feet below. Yurik ignored them and unhooked his armor to attend to his wounds, but before he could begin, Lyra was beside him, stamping her foot on the frozen s- scarlet snow and shouting to the bears to stop smashing the palace because there was prisoners inside. They didn't hear, but Yurik did, and when he roared, they stopped at once. Human prisoners, Yurik said, yes. You're for Ragnus and put them in a dungeon. They ought to come out first and get shelter else somewhere, else they'll be killed of all the falling rocks. Yurik gave a swift order, and some bears hurried into the palace to release the prisoners. Lai returned to Yurik. Let me help you. I want to make sure you ain't too badly hurt, Yurik, dear. Oh, I wish there was some bandages or something. That's an awful cut on your belly. A bear laid a mouthful of some stiff green stuff, thickly frosted on the ground at Yurik's feet. Blood moss, said Yurik. Press it in the wounds for me, Lyra. Fold the flesh over it and then hold some snow there till it freezes. He wouldn't let any bears attend to him despite their eagerness. Besides, Lyra's hands were deft, and she was desperate to help. So the small human bent over the great bear king, packing in the blood moss and freezing and freezing the raw flesh till it stopped bleeding. When she finished her when she finished, her mittens were sodden, soaked with Yurik's blood, but his wounds were snatched, stanched. And by that time, the prisoners, a dozen or so men, shivering and blinking and huddling together, had come out. There was no point in take, talking to the, to the professor, Lyra decided, because the poor man was mad, and she would have liked to know who the other men were, but there were many other urgent things to do. And she didn't want to distract Yurik, who was giving rapid orders and sending bears scurrying this way and that. But she was anxious about Roger and about Lee Scoresby and the witches, and she was hungry and tired. She thought the best thing she could do then was just to keep out of the way. So she curled up in a quiet corner of the combat ground with Pantalaemon as a wolverine to keep her warm and piled snow over herself as a bear would do and went to sleep. Something nudged her foot, 
and a strange bear voice said, Lyra Silvertongue, the king wants you. <laughs> she woke up nearly dead with cold and couldn't open her eyes, for they had frozen shut. But Pantalaemon licked them to melt the ice on her eyelashes, and soon she was able to see the young bear speaking to her in the moonlight. She tried to stand, but fell over twice. The bear said, ride on me, and crouched to offer his broad back, and half clinging, half falling, she managed to stay on while he took her to the steep hollow, where many bears were assembled. And among them was a small figure who ran towards her, and whose demon leaped up to greet Pantalaemon. Roger, she said. Yurik Burnison made me stay out there in the snow while he came to fetch you away. We fell out of the balloon, Lyra. After you fell out, we got carried miles and miles, and then Mr. Scoresby let some more gas out, and we crashed into a mountain. And we fell down such a slope like you never seen. And I don't know where Mr. Scoresby is now, nor the witches. There was just me and Yurik Burnison. He came straight back this way to look for you, and they told me about his fight. Lyra looked around. Under the direction of an older bear, the human prisoners were building a shelter out of driftwood and scraps of canvas. They seemed pleased to have some work to do. One of them was striking a flint to light a fire. There is food, said the young bear, who had woken Lyra. A fresh seal lay on the snow. The bear sliced it open with a claw and showed Lyra where to find the kidneys. She ate one raw. It was warm and soft and delicious beyond imagining. Eat the blubber, too, said the bear, and tore off a piece for her. It tasted of cream flavored with hazelnuts. Roger hesitated but followed her example. They ate greedily. And within a very few minutes, Lyra was fully awake and beginning to be warm. Wiping her mouth, she looked around, but Yurik was not in sight. Yurik Burnison is speaking with his counselors, said the young bear. He wants to see you when you have eaten. Follow me. He led them over a rise in the snow to a spot where bears were beginning to build a wall of ice blocks. Yurik sat at the center of a group of older bears, and he rose to greet her. Lyra, Lyra Silvertongue, he said, come and hear what I am being told. He didn't explain her presence to the other bears, or perhaps they had learned about her already, but they made room for her and treated her with immense courtesy, as if she were a queen. She felt proud beyond measure to sit behind, beside her friend Yurik Burnison under the aurora, as it flickered gracefully in the polar sky and joined the conversation of the bears. It turns out that Yurfa Rachnison's dominance over them had been like a spell. Some of them put it down to the influence of Mrs. Coulter, who had visited him before Yurik's exile. Though Yurik had, known, had not known about it, he and given Yurfa various presents... She gave him a drug, said one bear, which he f fed secretly to Halmer Halmerson and made him forget himself. Halmer Halmerson, I'm saying that wrong, guys, I'm sorry, Lyra gathered, was the bear whom Yurik had killed and whose death had brought about his exile. So Mrs. Coulter was behind that, and there was more. There are human laws that prevent certain things that she was planning to do, but human laws don't apply on Slobbard. She wanted to set up another station here, like Bulvanger, only worse, and Yurfer was going to allow her to do it, against all the custom of the bears, because humans have visited or been imprisoned, but never lived and worked here. Little by little, she was going to increase her power over Yurfer Ragnason and his over us, until we were her creatures running back and forth at her bidding, and our only duty to guard the abomination she was going to create that was an old bear that was an old bear speaking his name was soren irison and he was a counselor who had suffered under yurfer rackinson what is she doing now lyra lyra said yurfer i i'm sorry what is she doing now lyra said yurik bernison once she hears of yurfer's death what will her plans be Lyra took out the owl thermometer. There was not much light to see it by, and Yura commanded that a torch be brought. What happened to Mr. Scoresby, Lyra said while they were waiting, and the witches? The witches were attacked by another witch clan. I don't know if the others were allied to the child cutters, but they were patrolling our skies in vast numbers, and they attacked in the storm. I didn't see what happened to Seraphina Pecola. As for Lee Scoresby, the balloon soared up again, again after I fell out with a boy, taking him with it but your symbol reader will tell you what their fate is. A bear pulled up a sledge on which a cauldron of charcoal was smoldering and thrust a resinous branch into the heart of it. 
The branch caught at once, and in its glare, Lyra returned the hands of the owl thermometer and asked about Lee Scoresby. It turned out that he was still aloft, still floating, borne by the winds toward Nova Zembla, and that he had been unharmed by the cliff gas and had fought over the other witch clan, and had fought off the other witch clan. Lyra told Yurik, and he nodded, satisfied. If he is in the air, he will be safe, he said. What a Mrs. Coulter. The answer was complicated, with the needles swinging from symbol to symbol in sequence that made Lyra puzzle for a long time. The bears were curious, but restrained by the respect for Yurik Burnison and for and his for Lyra. And she put them out of her mind and sank again into the alphamometer trance. The play of symbols, once she had discovered the pattern of it, was dismaying. It says she's, she's heard about us flying this way, and she's got a transport zeppelin that's armed with machine guns. I think that's it. And they're flying to Slobard right now. She don't know yet about Yurfa Rackinson being beaten, of course, but she will soon because, oh yes, because some witches will tell her, and they'll learn it from the cliff gas. So I reckon there are spies in the air all around, Yurik. She was coming to to pretend to help Yurfa Rackinson, but really she was going to take over the power from him with a regiment of Tartars that's a coming by sea, and they'll be here in a couple of days. And as soon as she can, she's going to where Lord Asriel is kept prisoner, and she's intending to have him killed. Because it's coming clear now, something I never understood before, Yurik. It's why she wants to kill Lord Asriel. It's because she knows what he's going to do, and she fears it. And she wants to do it herself and gain control before he does. It must be the city in the sky. It must be. She's trying to get it first. And now it's telling me something else. She bent over the instrument, concentrating furiously as the needle darted this way and that. It moved almost too fast to follow. Roger, looking over her shoulder, couldn't even see it stop, and was conscious only of a swift flickering dialogue between Lyra's fingers turning the hands and the needles answering, as bewilderingly until unlike language as the Aurora was. Yes, she said finally, putting the instrument down in her lap and blinking and sighing as she woke up of her profound concentration. Yes, I see what it says. She's after me again. She wants something I've got because Lord Asriel wants it too. They need it for this, for this experiment, whatever it is. She stopped there to take a deep breath. Something was troubling her and she didn't know what it was. She was sure that this was, this something that was so important was the owl thermometer itself because it, after all, Mrs. Coulter had wanted it and what else could it be? And yet it wasn't, because the alphamometer had a different way of referring to itself, and this wasn't it. I suppose it's the alphamometer, she said unhappily. It's what I thought all along. I've got to take it to Lord Asriel before she gets it. If she gets it, we'll all die. As she said that, she felt so tired, so bone-deep, weary, and sad, that to die would have been a relief. But the example of Yurik kept her from admitting it. She put the alphamometer away and sat up straight. How far away is she, said Yurik. Just a few hours, I suppose I ought to take the alphamometer to Lord Asriel as soon as I can. I will go with you, said Yurik. She didn't argue. While Yurik gave commands and organized an armed squad to accompany them on the final part of their journey north, Lyra sat still, conserving her energy. She felt that something had gone out of her during that last reading. She closed her eyes and slept, and presently they woke her and set off. All right. So we're going to find out what Lord Asriel has to say to Lyra. He still doesn't know that she knows that she's his daughter. And sorry for all the mispronunciations, guys. Some of these words and names are a little challenging even for me.